Hello and welcome to the Future Food Finance Podcast. We've got another great episode. We're discussing Berlin as a food tech hotspot. So we're joined by founders of two uh, food tech startups who are discussing why they believe fermentation is a game changer in alternative proteins. They also discuss the relative merits of US um, vis-a-vis um, uh, European uh, investors. And they also discuss why they think Berlin is one of the hottest places, the best places to um, to launch a food tech uh, startup. So uh, podcast coming up and uh, please do remember to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and Spotify and check into Future Food Finance each week where we've got a roundup of how the um, best performing public listed companies are performing. Hello and welcome to the Future Food Finance Podcast. My name is John Reynolds, the host. This week we are focusing in on a particular city, which is Berlin, as a food tech hub. And I'm speaking to two bosses of early stage food tech startups based in the German capital. So we are joined by Tim Fronzek, the co-founder and CEO of Nosh Biofoods, the fermentation-based ingredients firm, and Hendrik K., who's the CEO and co-founder of Essentia Foods, which is looking to revolutionize the seafood uh, food system with mycelium. So thanks very much for, for joining me. It's great to have you both on. So start with you, uh, Tim. Can we just get a, a kind of a brief history of your CV and then just a, a brief overview of, of, of uh, Nosh Biofoods first? Sure, sure. Uh, and thanks for the introduction and also thanks for the invitation. Happy to join uh, this podcast. Yeah, I'm Tim, uh, 43 years old, having a business background, um, studied business administration back in 2003, founded my first company during that time together with four friends of mine. We started running an online retailer for pre owned consumer electronics and media items. Um, the idea back then already was that we wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of mass consumption as a behavior of, of the mass markets. And we tried to achieve that by professionalizing pre-owned trading and with that extending product life cycles, appreciating bound resources just a bit more and also saving the carbon emissions that is typically um, cost by producing those products newly. I was with that company for a bit more than 15 years until the beginning of 2020 left it when we made close to 200 million in net sales on a profitable basis, employing roughly 600 people over four entities within the group. Um, I took almost a year off then, just spent time with my kids and then um, yeah, became humble again and uh, thought about what could be next. Um, with a clear focus on ideas that can have an impact on, on climate change and help solving the problem, which was my main motivation for the 15 years with Rebuy, but uh, yeah, still is uh, what kind of um, concerns me and also what drives me. And uh, with that focus, uh, I ended up in the food industry and luckily got introduced by a friend of mine who is an entrepreneur within the alternative protein space already uh, to my actual co-founder, Philippe. Yeah, we met each other um, and beside uh, the fact that his idea of using fermentation as a platform and tool to decentralize the global protein production, um, he was a, or he still is a super nice person, nice character. We are sharing a comparable set of values. So it was an easy decision uh, that we took early 2021 to join forces. And uh, yeah, start working on the idea of Nosh. Okay, and you're you're, you're an ingredient firm. So you're making, you make it. You're in an ingredients firm now. Exactly. So um, the question we asked ourselves uh, when we started was really, what is the problem, uh, and what um, would a proper solution need to look like? And what we um, pretty soon realized is from a climate change perspective, the food industry has the problem uh, that we are simply eating too much meat and uh, which caused this phenomenon of uh, industrial animal farming, which is by far the biggest contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. And um, we realized that there's already um, quite some products in the market uh, that are animal free and that try to kind of enable this transition from animal based to animal free diets. But all those problems, uh, all those products have comparable problems. Uh, which is they can only work with the ingredients they have. Uh, and that doesn't allow to come up with products that are really competitive. 
neither in terms of taste nor in terms of texture and physical structures, but also not in terms of nutritional values and health aspects. Um, there is typically a lot of chemicals in those animal-free products simply to replicate the physical structure of animal-based foods. And then um, last but not least, they are also too expensive. So um, the average household is simply not able to pay a premium on day-to-day -day food products. So that's why we came up with the idea of using fermentation and um, microbes, here specifically filamentous uh, fungi, uh, in order to create this new class of highly functional food ingredients that are healthy, bring nutritional values, and that can be produced at low cost and um, yeah, can therefore also uh, compete in terms of price in order to help existing products to leverage the quality, improve the quality, lower the cost profiles, and come up with super cool products that finally are really appealing to the mass market. Okay, right, there's loads of nil. We'll come back to that. Let's get bring Hendrik in. Can we get, just get a brief yeah. overview of your your CV, including your age, and um, a, a bit about Essentia uh, Foods too? Okay, so also thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm Hendrik, I'm 34 years old, and I have a commercial background uh, like Tim. So I studied economics and then I switched to, to Deloitte, where I worked in mergers and acquisitions for about three years. And then I worked at Emma, Emma Mattress. Um, I joined uh, this company when it was also a smaller startup, around 45 full-time employees and uh, actually the same number of interns. I joined as a chief of staff and made it up to a leadership positions and well, was part of scaling this company. And uh, when I left, like two and a half years later, Emma had 650 people. Um, so it was quite a right. And I actually also left with the desire to, to found my own business, but also to use my skills to bring change to this world. And as uh, Tim already said, um, the area of food is one of the biggest area. But also what happened at the same time is um, that I changed my, my diet. So I got away from meat, but for me, it was really hard to leave fish behind and to leave seafood behind um, because I just I really like to eat this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the alternatives that were there back then um, and that still are there on the market, they didn't satisfy me, but it didn't start with me. So what I did was I went around a bit and I interviewed a lot of uh, vegetarians and vegans. And um, when I then asked, are you actually really vegetarian or do you still eat fish? A lot of them confirmed um, that they still eat and like to eat fish, right? Um, and I thought, uh, wow, that's a problem to tackle. And at this time, I also met my co-founder, Bruno, um, who brings in the, the scientific mind and the scientific genius, so to say. So he is a PhD in biophysics and also professionally worked as a chef. And um, together, we got obsessed about the problem and actually how to solve it. And um, well, uh, as, as Tim already said, the current um, products on the market have shortcomings when it comes to taste, when it comes to texture, uh, particularly, and also when it comes to price. And um, well, we then thought how to tackle this problem. And we really started with this problem focus to then select the technology and ended up also with uh, fermentation. Okay. Right. Okay. That, that's fantastic. So there's there's obvious similarities, uh, which is good for me in terms of this podcast. So you're obviously both in, in food tech. You're both Berlin-based. And you're both, I think, at a kind of similar stage. Um, perhaps um, Tim's is a bit more advanced. And you're both, as you've rightly pointed out, championing, champion, uh, championing fermentation. And now you've talked a bit about, just, just let's go into a bit of detail about that, because some people think, Fermentation is uh, the big game changer in alternative protein. In, in alternative proteins, more so than plant-based. And the other week we had a, a podcast about cultivated meat, and you've kind of touched on some of those. What you know, I think you both kind of talked about shortcomings in other alternative proteins. So, Tim, just well, why do you think fermentation is a, a, a the big game changer in alternative proteins? <laughs> I think it definitely, um, it definitely can be uh, a big game changer. Uh, just want to add that when it comes to the discussion about fermentation, I think you uh, have to to do the differentiation between precision fermentation, which is kind of a, I would say, new technology, which is mainly about genetic engineering, um, and the kind of common technology, which is biomass fermentation, which is the technology that we are running, um, which is a technology that has already been used in the food industry for decades, to be honest. So there is a lot of cheese, there is some uh, wines, beers uh, that are following the principle of um, 
of, of biomass fermentation in a way. So it's not that it is completely new, but what is new is to use the technology in order to grow microbes that are, um, and as said, I mean, you can, you can do yeast with that technology. You could do bacteria with this, uh, with bacteria with this technology. But what we're doing is uh, using a filamentous fungi because it is rich in protein. And uh, I think the, the game changer for the industry can really be that it gives you the opportunity to produce uh, a highly uh, an ingredient with a high nutritional value at a very low cost. So I think you can summarize, summarize it like that. But in addition, I would say it also provides this solution for the question of how should we feed mankind in 20 to 30 uh, years from today, because the technology is completely climate independent. It can be decentralized. You could build up your fermentation site somewhere in the desert. Um, and it has significantly less requirements for space. So you can reduce the space requirements probably by 60 to 70% um, with using fermentation. And um, that's just uh, an additional super interesting aspect around this technology. Okay, that's great. And Hendrik, you're, you're, so your company, is the, you're saying you're the first startup in Europe to produce a seafood alternative with, with based on mushroom mycelium. Yes, uh, exactly. Um, so we were starting from this uh, seafood angle, particularly. And um, in the end, why do you eat uh, a fish or a seafood? You eat it because of the high protein content and you also like it because of the texture. And when you now think about the problem again and you think about uh, pea protein, soy protein powders and you want to recreate um, something like a velvety fish texture, you will realize that this is just a very hard problem, if not an impossible problem to, to solve, right? And um, having said this, we basically looked at uh, mycelium and we found that mycelium grows in filaments and these filaments are very similar to the muscle structure of the fish. So if you just imagine the muscle and you would take, um, you would put it on a microscope and you would zoom in, what you find is small filaments on the size of like 12 to 20 micrometers and mycelium also grows in these um, filaments. So we use the filaments and we also use the gelling properties of the mycelium to recreate the seafood. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good explanation. And just, uh, sorry, I didn't kind of, I should have asked this. I, I kind of banded you as both early stage. So Tim, just tell us what stage you're at and who, I mean, do you have, in terms of ingredients, who are your customers or who, who are your potential customers? Yeah, uh, I mean, we are a young company, so we've just incorporated last year in February. So we are a bit more than one and a half years old by now, uh, but we are already quite advanced. So the kind of concept, the products, um, it's it's all there. We are at the moment um, preparing our scale up. So we start industrial scale production within mid of next month already. So we are going to produce the first time at an industrial scale uh, site, 3.5 tons of our product. Um, obviously, we also need already to be in contact with several different uh, customers, and our customers uh, are the industrial customer, uh, the industrial companies uh, that are uh, producing um, plant-based or let's say animal-free products uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and yeah, they are just uh, using our ingredient in order to clean the labels off because they have to use a lot of chemicals um, as our microprotein is highly functional. Uh, it, can it can substitute uh, more or less all of those chemicals um, within the recipe. It can substitute um, parts or maybe even all of the plant protein itself um, and brings a product that is um, more valuable in terms of nutrition, uh, that is healthier, that it has a better structure, that has a more pleasant taste because our um, microprotein uh, is, has a very neutral, pleasant taste, so it has no off tastes. And um, due to the technology, as already mentioned, it can be produced at a very low cost. So um, the uh, customers can also reduce their cost profiles. Um, yeah, so that's the stage we are in. Uh, and that's about the customers that we are um, approaching. That's great. And Hendrik, I think you're a bit, uh, instead, in terms of the companies, that you're at a kind of earlier stage. And can you just, I mean, you've been quite damning or talked about the shortcomings of, I mean, there's um, things like uh, cultivated uh, or fish alternatives, but I mean, you're quite kind of critical of the um, that as a product in terms of the taste and texture. Then, 
Um, actually, I didn't say yet that I'm critical of the texture of cultivated products. Uh, <laughs> um, I, this is a topic by itself, right? Uh, the cultivated product. But uh, I would like to come back to your original question. So who is my customer? Um, and how far advanced are we actually? Uh, so we also incorporated uh, last year, uh, half a year later than the team did. So that was uh, like late summer last year. And um, we are also now actually far enough that we produced uh, sufficient biomass um, and also made dishes out of it. So what we will do is that we uh, also present our product at uh, at a fair, at a large gastronomy fair uh, in October already, right? And um, basically with that prepare also for industrial scale up, which for us means um, up to four tons uh, per, per month. Um, and we start preparing for this also by um, mid of next year. So we are indeed a little bit, uh, yeah, earlier than, than Tim, but I would say uh, it's like a, a six to, to eight month uh, delta here. Okay, all right, that, that, that's great. And can you just talk about investors in terms of their appetite for alternative proteins? It seems like um, quite a, a crowded uh, market. From my understanding, Tim, you've got both US and European investors. Can you also... Can you talk a bit about, uh, I might be uh, kind of stereotyping here, but do do US investors tend to be a bit more kind of gung-ho, a bit more adventurous, and European investors are a bit more reserved, or is that horribly stereotyping what investors are like? No, I would say in general that's that's exactly what it <laughs> what it looks like and and how it feels. Um, you're right. We have both. Uh, we have uh, German investors. We, uh, we I mean we have four uh, shareholders um, that invested within our seed round in uh, Q1 this year. So we have one um, coming from the US, clear current capital. Uh, we have Early Bird. Um, I would say top ten in Europe probably um, who who led the round. Um, and then we have one smaller uh, Good Seed Ventures um, from Germany and one smaller from Italy, uh, which is Gray Silo Ventures. They are all, um, I would say, super, super cool partners, but uh, it took us a while to really select the crowd. We are now super happy um, in terms of how much time yeah, d- did it take in order to convince um, I would say it was significantly more straightforward with the with the U.S. investor compared to the European ones, which is um, fine uh, and not a problem. But uh, I wouldn't say it's a stereotype. I think it kind of describes the reality. All right, that's interesting. And Hendrik, I, I don't. Know, I think you, have you got European investors, or can you? I mean, do you agree with that? That I don't know if you had any dealings with U.S. investors, but do do European investors tend to be over or, or more cautious? Indeed, I do agree with this. So we also have uh, four venture capital firms on, on board, uh, which is Big Idea Ventures, uh, who are also rooted in the United States, um, plug and play. Um, so we received investment from the Italian team, but in the end, you also feel the US um, um, or the Silicon Valley spirit, so to say, um, Serpentine from, from Switzerland. Um, yeah, and also Entrepreneur First. Um, so basically, we, we don't have a German investor. Um, despite being a German company. Um, we have some German angels, though. But overall, I would say it is indeed, um, it just takes more time and more preparation, um, more, um, I would say this, more strategy and so on to convince German investors. Um, but, well, for me, it's important to also have German investors on board. Um, and I think this is also something I'm aiming for in my, in my, seed, in my seed round. Why, why is it more? Why is it what, just? Why is it important to have German investors? Well, in the end, if you look for an investor that also brings in smart capital in the form of uh, connections to the market, um, and you are in a German company, I think it just makes makes sense to also have a German investor to accompany you. All right, it's not a must, but um, I would say it's, it would definitely be uh, nice to have. Okay, right. Okay, thanks very much. So let's just talk about the main topic, which was um, which which is Berlin, which is a uh, I think it's widely seen as a, a food tech uh, hub. I, I guess you've had um, in recent years kind of big famous companies which have uh, emanated from from Berlin, like um, um, uh, Delivery Hero. I'm sure there's many others. Maybe SoundCloud, but that's obviously not a, a food tech company. Can uh, Tim? Can can you talk a bit about? 
What are the advantages and disadvantages? What would you say the top two advantages and disadvantages to be based in, in Berlin? I don't, you probably never, I don't know if you can compare to other European or other global cities. Yeah. I mean, um, the reason I'm in Berlin and, and also, I mean, part of the motivation or the, the reasons why Nosh is in Berlin is uh, because back in the days, 2006, we got our first funding for, for Rebuy back in the days. And then we had this conscious decision of about, okay, where are we going to grow the company? At that time, Berlin and Germany was yeah, for an e-commerce startup by far the most attractive um, city due to the fact that it uh, has quite a nice infrastructure. Um, the rental was quite low at that time and you had a lot of high qualified, uh, high skilled workers and uh, in addition, uh, high unemployment rate. So this in combination uh, made it to be a great um, place to be. Uh, obviously, some of those advantages are not there anymore. So um, rental supply of, of flats, uh, that's a problem today, I would say, also a problem for us. The reason um, why we are still in Berlin, still you have a lot of high qualified um, people here. There is a lot of universities, also uh, qu quite some nice um, food campuses uh, around with, with good education, uh, which obviously is important for us. And then also what comes in addition, Berlin is a very attractive city. Uh, and I don't know how oh, this is uh, at Essentia, but for Nosh, I can say we are really um, a multi culty team already. We have 15 people on, on the payroll by now. I think we are already representing eight or nine different countries, uh, three different continents. So it's really a challenge to get those experts that you're looking for and you have to screen the market really worldwide. And then it's really a plus if you can tell the people, okay, you need to move to Berlin. That's simply different than from explaining them you have to move to, I don't know, Cologne or, or Dortmund or I don't know any other city in Germany uh, I think that's just not comparable and that's a big plus of Berlin okay but I mean I guess you could argue those advantages like infrastructure uh, rental highly skilled uh, international workforce you, you could get those advantages in in London Amsterdam or I guess London's still a more expensive city yeah, that's, I mean, that's true. I mean, outside of Germany, that's, uh, that's a different, uh, different game. Um, but as, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, German uh, and yeah. therefore also, um, my education in business is, is German. So running a German liability company is just a bit more my home turf than going to a different country and, um, yeah, uh, run a run a different uh, liability so that's why the preparation was uh, or the, the the preference was um for for germany and then within germany berlin i mean berlin also has a great network which i would like to add so you have a lot of cool people around like hendrik but many other food startups and also different kind of founders startups so the scene is quite um quite nice as well and quite beneficial um an additional thing and when we um, decided to start nosh in um, Berlin and in Germany, basically, we, we had a conscious look on Belgium as well, mm -hmm. because my co-founder at that time lived, uh, still lived in, in Belgium. And we also took a look to, uh, to the Nordics. And uh, one additional uh, argument was um, that the landscape of subsidies and grants in Germany seemed to be beneficial compared to those um, other areas. So that's why we consciously took the decision to stay in Berlin and therefore stay in Germany. Okay, yeah, that's clear. And just, just final point. So there's no, you, you touched on it there, there's no kind of second city, there's, there's no a city in Germany which you could compare it to. I guess Munich is not, I don't know, it's, it's not really a food tech and it's, I guess that's expensive too, is it? Yes, it is. And I think it's like probably if you, if you want to take two cities in Germany that are, um, far away from each other in terms of its its characteristics. I think there is probably no cities <laughs> that are far away from apart than Berlin and Munich. So it's th this is really different, I would say. Comparable to Berlin, I would maybe name Hamburg and Cologne, but then that's probably it in Germany from my perspective. Right. And Hendrik, let's, same question. What, what's the big advantages uh, for Essentia that uh, Berlin presents? Uh, so I need to agree. One big advantage of uh, Berlin is indeed the network. Uh, you have, uh, for example, uh, Kitchen Town, you have the Food Tech Camp, you have uh, Edeka Food uh, Starters. So there you can meet a lot of um, other also early stage uh, food companies, uh, which just helps you to get to certain market insights, to get to connections, to get to intros. Um, and therefore, you can just move a lot faster in the, in the early days. Um, at the same time, we are based in both Berlin and Barcelona, so I can actually make a direct comparison um, also to a very attractive city. 
only to say. Um, I would say that both cities uh, have their have their uh, advantages. So um, Berlin is definitely the network, and Barcelona is also becoming a food tech hub, but uh, it's still much smaller. Um, and at the same time, uh, when you when you hire, right? And we also have uh, three full time employees uh, and and uh, four interns on the payroll at the moment. Um, when you hire, like both the cities are similarly attractive. Um, having said this, um, I think you have some strong com competition uh, in in Europe to Berlin, but in in Germany, I don't see a second uh, food tech hub. Okay, yeah. So I brought it out. So you don't you don't look look enviously to other cities in Europe or the US. I mean, we kind of touched on the investors being a lot more adventurous and a lot more appetite for investing in startups. Do you think your respective startups would be more successful or uh, a better environment would be in in the US? Or that's a difficult jump to make. I guess is it, Tim? Yeah, I think that's difficult to say. And I'm not a big fan of complaining about um, the reality and the facts. And I mean, uh, the reason we are in Germany and in Berlin is based on the decision that we decided to start the company here. So therefore, I'm not complaining about the um, the, the atmosphere uh, within the financial markets and the kind of different characteristics of financial investors. That's just something we have to deal with. Uh, I mean, we are also used to that. Um, we, we had a lot of European and German investors uh, in my previous company as well. So um, this is not a problem. What um, does not mean uh, that the U.S., might also be an attractive, um, an attractive area and geography um, in terms of um, business, but also in terms of um, financial investors. So it's definitely something that we have on the radar. Right. Okay. Uh, final question. So, um, where will you be in five years' time? Let's start with you, Hendrik. Or where do you hope your food tech company is in five years' time? Uh, where do I hope to be? So. Um, for Essentia, the, the root of the business is um, building a biology-based natural alternative. Um, having said this, we first of all want to solve um, the, the seafood problem, right? Um, but the bigger mission is that in the end, every European uh, consumes one, one mycelium-based um, plate per month. Be it um, be it meat, be it seafood, be it a new center of the plate alternative, and that's basically um, the mission that we are following, and uh, which we will have made significant process to in, in 2028. Okay, Tim. I mean, the nice thing is that our ingredients can play a role in different verticals within the food industry. We can potentially play a role in meat. That's that's for sure. But we can also play a role in bakery and beverages, in convenience and confectionery. We have already application served in all of those verticals. But to make it easy, just take the meat market. So the meat market globally is roughly about 1.1 trillion US dollars big. Um, meat analogs within that doesn't even sum up to 10 billion. So we are talking about a market share of not even a percentage. So it's insignificantly small. And I'm convinced the problem is that the products are not competitive, not in terms of quality, but also not in terms of price. And I'm quite confident that we can help the existing players to leverage that and solve those problems. And therefore, I hope that we can really um, enable and speed up this transition from animal-based to animal-free diets within the next five to ten years. Right. Okay. That was great. I really appreciate it. And uh, the listeners should uh, bear in mind that they are both speaking in their second language. So, uh, Tim and Hendrik, thanks for being very eloquent and very informative. And that was the Future Food Finance uh, Podcast.